Hi, it's Robin. I've got here a kind of ridiculous stack of more or less 1990s audiovisual components, whether you want to call it a home entertainment system, a home theater, a hi-fi system, although it has some video in it. I've got a CD changer, an AV receiver, a dual cassette deck, and a VCR. And in the middle, a Commodore CD TV which is what inspired this video. But we'll take a quick look at the other components too, as I think it's important for the context of the CDTV. I didn't realize when I was putting the stack together that it was going to be hard to even get it in frame. So I'm going to move the camera closer now. So we'll just work through the components here from the bottom. I said mostly 1990s. This is the biggest cheat. This is a Sony CDP CX355. It is a 300 CD changer, and it's from 2002. It's completely ridiculous. I figured if I'm going to cheat the 90s thing a bit, I'm going to cheat for the sake of awesomeness. Check this out. We'll open it up here. And it's got a carousel here that can hold 300 CDs. Put them in with the label to the right, and they're each numbered. That's number one. You can advance 100 CDs here or 100 slots anyway. So here around slot number 100, I'll put another one in. I won't load it all up, let's close it. And it scans the whole carousel. There you go. This is my CD place without a computer, board in my room. Okay, and we can advance here to disk 100. I actually had to repair this. A couple belts were broken, or no good anymore. Okay, and there's Information Society. It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. So, it's a completely ridiculous thing. <laughs> can gradually go through. Even allows you to plug in a PS2 keyboard so you can type in all your CD track names. I've never fully loaded it up, but it's about 5 kilograms or over 10 pounds worth of CDs. In total, it weighs about 13.5 kilograms or just under 30 pounds fully loaded. Next up, I've got my Kenwood AV Surround Receiver, VR205. And I'm mostly just using this as an input selection. I had it on my CD player. And next up, I'll move it with the input selector to tape. It also allows video to pass through. So the VCR and the Commodore CD TV are run through it. And yeah, I don't have any speakers hooked up to it, as I'm just directly capturing the audio from it anyway. And here's a pro tip. Over YouTube, you can't really tell how somebody else's speakers sound. It's because it goes through a microphone and compression in their computer through YouTube, and ultimately it plays out your speakers. So don't get too hung up on that. We'll skip over the CD TV for the moment because we'll spend the rest of the video on that. This is my Pioneer dual tape deck, CT1270WR. And here's Claude Dengen and the Moog Synthesizer. I hope I have that right. That is so good. At the top of the stack is my JVC VCR, an HR VP676U. I just always love JVC VCRs. I have a few different models that are similar to this one. And while I was working on this video, Robbie Coltrane passed away. And he's an actor in one of my all-time favorite movies here, Slipstream. So let's watch a tiny snippet. This is forbidden territory. What are you doing? 
answer or die. You're under arrest. All of you. For carrying contraband. You hear that, boys? We're all under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> Why, I could die of embarrassment. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now on to the main event, the Commodore CDTV. You might think that just stands for compact disc because it does take compact discs and television. But no, it stands for Commodore Dynamic Total Vision, apparently. And in fact, because it's called the Commodore CDTV, it's the Commodore Commodore Dynamic Total Vision. And actually with the Commodore symbol there, which of course just stands for Commodore, Maybe we could even call it the Commodore 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 Dynamic Total Vision. It's a good name. So you may already know that this is more or less an Amiga 500 in a stereo or home theater component box, but I really want to show it in the context of a full system because that's what Commodore wanted it to be known as originally. You'll notice they didn't even put the Amiga name on it, and that's because they didn't want it to be seen as a computer. It was meant to be part of your home theater, hooked up to your television in your living room. So huge thank you to my friend David. I thought he gave this to me. He says he actually sold it to me, but I think he sold it to me so cheap that I filed it away as free. <laughs> it actually wasn't working at first, but it was, uh, I don't even remember if I repaired it, it was easy. And then I've picked up a couple pieces over the years, including stuff from David to make it a more workable system. So it was many years ago that I got the CDTV, and I think in 2019, he finally found the remote control for it and gave it to me. And then when I was at VCF Midwest, just a month or so ago, he had found a couple more actual CDTV branded titles for it. So we're gonna be looking at all that today. And yes, this is more than eight bits. I hope you'll forgive me. Although actually it's got a couple of 8-bit microcontrollers in it that we'll take a very brief look at later when we open this up. But first we're just going to take a look at using it as it was intended. Well, I'll just change the input selector to video 1. And it was already running so there's a screensaver. We'll look at the front panel here. There's the power button. I'll switch it off and switch it on again. You'll see it boots up to this pretty cool CDTV laser picture. It has a quarter inch headphone jack, the CD slot that requires a caddy. We'll look at that in a moment. You don't just stick a CD directly in. Next is the infrared remote receiver. And it is infrared, but actually it's quite good when it's working properly. It's, it's quite receptive. In line with the VCRs of the time is a digital clock. It's actually a cover missing here, but inside here it looks like a PCM CIA slot. It's actually a specialized memory card that are very rare. And over here are controls to play and stop, fast forward and rewind for regular CD playback. And you can adjust the volume here and change modes. And there's also a reset button just to restart the machine. We'll look at the ports on the back later. So here is the remote control. You see it has like a D-pad over here, which is okay for playing games, and an A and a B button. So in a way it's a lot like a NES controller. And in the middle section here, a number pad, volume controls, CD controls, Genlock, which you have to have the very optional Genlock module for it, button to switch between the CD and the TV mode and joystick or mouse emulation. A later version of this had a more sensible switch, so you could choose between joy and mouse. There's no feedback at all about what mode this is in, so like a toggle is pretty awful. And there's the IR remote. And it takes two AA batteries. If you press any button, It'll go into this preferences screen. And here you can set the time and the date. Just punch in different values here. Press A here. You can 
center the screen. You can set the timeout length. Interlace on or off. I don't know how that'll look on the capture. Turn off sound effects. Now you can choose your language. There, English. Or, I didn't know there's a language called American. Yeah, this actually has an Easter egg built into it. Did I promise that yet? So the way to get it is to go into the language select, move on top of American, and then what you have to do is a series of left and right moves that spell <laughs> Commodore CDTV Remote Controller. And by spell, you push right whenever you want to spell an O, which is pretty common. And for every other word, you press left. Oh, I timed out. Let's try that again. Left, right, left, left, right, left, right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right. Left, 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 right. Left, 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 right. Left, 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 left. Press A again. Woo, it worked. What a crazy Easter egg. Okay, and what's happened is all the languages have been replaced with people at Commodore who either worked on it. Don Gilbert, Carl Sassenrath, Takashi Takoda, Reichart, Sachs did the art. He's the guy who did the famous art for Defender of the Crown. Oh, why'd it break? Why'd that clear? One more try. Sachs, William Ware, Leo Schwab, Steve Owens, Michael Lehman, Carrie Kuwata, Gail Wellington, Guy Wright, Steve Kreckman, Richard L. Unland, Irving Gould, the big uh, owner commodore. Oh, it reset again. That doesn't take long. Anyway, I guess I, we saw them all. Okay, so that's the Easter egg. Okay, so to try out this software here, the new Grolier Electronic Encyclopedia, which apparently retailed for $395 back in 1991 or something. I'll show a price listing from, uh, they found on archive.org. <laughs> As it says, it's all 21 volumes of the American Academic Encyclopedia on a single CDTV disc. Okay, so it's just a standard CD. But we have to put it in this caddy. It has a lift up lid. Drop it in there. Close the lid. And then put it in this way first. So it goes in and there we go. And it's loading. CDTV interactive multimedia from Commodore. Takes a while, boot. See, this is the version from May 6th. Welcome to the new Grolier Electronic Encyclopedia on CD ROM, a treasury of information, sights, and sounds for the entire family. <laughs> so, yeah, this was really at the, the very beginning of the whole multimedia thing. So, you can type in stuff to search for. Let's try that. Let's try searching for computer title search. I think you got to type in the whole word. It doesn't. No articles were found with that word in the title. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, let's spell the whole thing out. This is when it would be nice to have the optional keyboard. Okay, title search for computer. And it takes a fair while. Oh, here we go. Bit, computer, personal, computer graphics, computer crime. Computer programming, sure. 
So it is only a single speed CD-ROM. Computer programming is the process or activity of developing programs or lists of instructions that control the operation of a computer. Ooh, without a software program, a computer is as useless as a bus without a driver. And then you can click on any word and it will do kind of like a cross reference. Oh, there it found bus. Uh, let's put T. Okay, here, return. Oh, we return to there. So I know this seems very quaint, but I guess you have to take this in the context. I'm just going to press B here, I think, to escape. In the context of not having the internet in your house in the early 90s. Browse pictures. Cats. Look, you could look for cat pictures even back then. Multimedia. A Japanese bobtail cat. Hmm. Japan's traditional good luck cat. Is a brightly colored calico. Okay. So I open up the caddy here. And David also gave me this power pinball game. So besides education and so on, at least part of the market here was for video games. And of course, there was the potential for it to be really good, but in practice, a lot of the games really seem kind of like cash grabs or like easy cash ins, a lot of shovelware. Power Pinball from KarmaSoft. I'm just pressing B. Drops a coin. Pull back. Oops. Well, oh, pressing A drops the coin. I've never really been... <laughs> I've never really been into uh, pinball games on the computer. Oh. Okay, that's enough of that. I guess it's not terrible, but it does have a bit of an amateur feel to it. Switch to a different camera. I don't know if it'll be better or worse. Apologies if it's worse. So we've looked at some software that you may have run on your CD TV, but there's other things. How about it as a CD player? I've got here Information Society's debut album. I'm choosing this one for a specific reason. It's hard to make out, but down here there's the regular compact disc digital audio symbol, but it has a small little box under it that says graphics. Okay, so we'll load this up, and if you stick in an audio CD, then this CD player comes up. I know I'm going to get hit with... Uh, Content match if I, I play much of this, but press the A button. It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. I wanna know what okay, so you can play the song. It's got the regular controls here. It's got some pretty neat Amiga style graphics. And here it shows you there's 10 tracks. Shows you what's playing. Shows you that either the time into the track or the time remaining on a track or total time left on the CD. And there's like a randomized feature here. And you can play the first 10 seconds of each track. You can loop it here. But it's got this 
different button down here, and this is either for MIDI or graphics. This is special CDs, where this UI comes up. Strangely, you can't control it with the D-pad. You actually, it's telling you you actually have to press the play button here. It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. I want to know what you're thinking. Okay, and I know I'm going to get a content match here, so I'm going to stick something else on for the audio. But you see that down at the bottom are the lyrics you're singing. And tell me what's on your mind. And up above is a slideshow of images. So these CD plus graphics, they actually have a graphics stream, a very low bit rate. And it can show these high resolution pictures. There actually weren't all that many devices that could play this, and there actually weren't all that many CD plus Gs made. And so Information Society, being a very geeky band, you might have seen my video I did a while ago about how they encoded a modem stream and a text file on one of their CDs, uh, one of their later albums. I made a video about decoding that. Well, this one, they went to the trouble of making up this huge slideshow every single song has many pictures like this full of graphics with trivia and just kind of goofy goofy stuff so <laughs> it's pretty amazing i wish i could let the whole thing run but copyright strikes and so on okay uh, maybe I'll do some karaoke of this. Well, yeah, one way that these CD plus G CDs live on is that a lot of karaoke machines use them. And so the graphics aren't used uh, in such a clever way, but there is the text for the lyrics down at the bottom. There's also CD plus MIDI files, which will play... MIDI versions of the music somehow, MIDI accompaniment? Uh, I don't have any of those, unfortunately. And as sort of a predecessor to DVDs, Commodore also released video discs. Now, I don't own any original of those, but some are archived on archive.org. And I just was able to download an ISO, burn it to CDR, and let's give this a try. Heroic Age of Space Flight, NASA, the 25th year. You can see how much like a DVD this is. Here's the menu. And you can curse around. It lets you choose the chapters. You can go to the About box here. And NASA, the 25th year, is a 50-minute digital motion picture adapted from a National Aeronautics and Space Administration film. This Troika production uses CDXL to produce a one-quarter screen, 10 frame per second digital motion picture. And unlike a regular movie, the viewer can select from Troika's indexing system only those parts he or she wants to see. Okay, so this was kind of cutting edge. I mean, it's sort of terrible. You can see already that's a quarter screen. Uh, here, we'll let it go. And play the entire CDXL movie. So yeah, it just plays in a window. <laughs> and yeah, 10 frames per second, if, if that. So this CDXL, interestingly, if you remember just recently I, in a video about the VCF Midwest, I was talking to my friend Greg, and he was showing full screen 30 frame per second video with sound on his Amiga 1200. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but that CDXL, he was talking about a patent Commodore made, that's this. 
antibiotics. So essentially what Greg's doing is just an extension of this video. So for 1991, maybe this was, was pretty impressive, I don't know. Then on October 7th, 1957, the U.S. and the rest of the world were greeted by the sounds of Sputnik 1. Apart from the indexing, really, you know, like the my VCR here is uh, probably a better option. It would not be until early the following year that America's satellite, Explorer 1, successfully orbited the Earth and discovered a dense belt of... And the video froze there. So I'll power that down. If anyone want to see my terrible wiring job, there's the VCR at the top. Then my tape deck. Then the CDTV. The Kenwood receiver. And the giant 300 CD changer from Sony. I'm going to take some of this apart. Okay, so across the back here. We've got this video slot that has RF out, channel select, composite video out, and S video out, which I'm not using today. But this is, whole thing is a module that could be replaced for different markets. I mentioned earlier that the, contr the controller has a Genlock button on it. You can get a Genlock unit here that will allow you to overlay video. And I think there's a separate one for either PAL or like a SCART output or something like that. There's, there's a variety and it's a module that can be replaced. Here's some computer ports. It's got the RGB video. That's a 23 pin connector and 25 pin parallel and serial connectors, just like an Amiga 500. Disk drive port, and we'll use that in a moment. It also has MIDI out, in and out ports, stereo audio out, it's got ports for a keyboard and a remote joystick or mouse. And there's the power supply fan. It just takes AC directly in. No external power brick required. Now, unfortunately, I don't have that keyboard. It's a strange connector. I do see somebody makes an adapter for that. So maybe I'll buy one of those. Okay, I'll hook that back up. Okay. And I've got here a floppy drive for my Amiga 500. This is a third party one. And I've powered off the computer. I'm just going to put that on top here and plug it into the disk drive port. And we'll swing this mess around again. Try powering up the CDTV again. And there's regular CDTV boot screen. But there's the lovely clicking Amiga floppy drive. And here's a copy of Deluxe Music Construction Set that I made, like, I don't know, back in the 80s, I think. And you see that now that floppy drive's in, we can just boot up. And here it is, coming up into Amiga DOS 1.3. <laughs> and it's just basically, yeah, it is like an Amiga now. It is an Amiga. So I can use the D-pad to move the mouse around somewhat tediously. Double click to open up the floppy disk. Here we are, Deluxe Music. Double click to start the program up. And we don't have to spend super long on this, but just to show that it is able to run Amiga software. And here we are. And if we hold down the B button, that's like the right mouse button. File, open score. And here we can pick up whatever, what the Bach Fugue in G minor. And what we gotta do here, click OK. And it'll load the music up.
at blazing Amiga 500 speeds. So some software is runnable, of course. Here we go. Play song. Of course, not having a keyboard is a major damper. So CDTV sold for about $1,000 originally in the U.S. And they expected, I think they made about 80,000 of them. And uh, they did not sell well. So there's a fantastic website called CDTV Land. And uh, there's all kinds of great articles on there, really in-depth. They made a new unofficial OS ROM upgrade for this, 2.35. You can check that out. So yeah, that CDTV land estimated that there was about 80,000 CDTVs made, but they didn't sell very well. And then Commodore wanted to get rid of them, so they bundled a floppy drive controller, or they bundled a floppy drive, a keyboard, mouse, and did sell them as essentially as Amigas. So at a thousand dollars, you can see why a thousand dollars in 1991, you can see why this probably wouldn't sell all that well, especially when the software was like four hundred dollars for the encyclopedia, fifty dollars for most of the games. Kind of the opposite, I think of a PS3, a Sony PlayStation 3, how it had a Blu-ray player in it. But actually, you could buy the PS3 for not all that much more than a good Blu-ray player would cost. And it was kind of like uh, an obvious purchase. Now, if this was in line with the prices of CD players in 1991, uh, you could see a lot of people buying them. You know, of course it would be more, but if they could make it only like $100 more, $200 more, not many hundreds of dollars more. Maybe it would have got a lot more adoption. And now we can use that reset button. Okay, we'll turn that off, turn all that off. Okay, and just to open up the CDTV, yes, it is a bit beat up. And just look at the insides very briefly. This is the back panel here, and you got the power supply on the side. And here is the main board, which is very similar to the Amiga 500 motherboard, but it has been redesigned. Similar in that it's like more or less the same components, but it has been designed specifically for the CDTV. Assembly number 250484, part number 252604-01, revision 2.2. .2. Whenever I see a 68000, this is the main CPU in person, it's enormous. I don't know for sure, but I think this must be one of the biggest dip chips ever made. So huge. Well, in a way, it's a 32-bit processor internally, but just has a 16-bit data bus. And I was talking about, you know, yes, yes, this is 8-bit show and tell. But there are a couple interesting chips here. The 6525A here is an input-output chip from the 6502 family. But this one's particularly interesting here. The LC6554H. It has the Sanyo name on it. Now this is actually a 4-bit microcontroller that has a 4-kilobyte ROM, 
one kilobit of RAM, 57 input-output pins, and this chip is not in an Amiga 500. It controls the front panel display of the CDTV, or actually the model number I didn't mention is a CD1000. So that front panel display that makes it fit in with stereo equipment is also controlled by that. Additionally, it reads the infrared sensor and the front panel button presses, and it passes those on to the 6500 one chip. Well, what's the 6500 slash one? Well, that's its neighbor right here, again with the CSG, Commodore Semiconductor Group, the 252609-02. This is actually a 6502 processor, but actually it's not just a, sorry, I said processor, but really it's a microcontroller, meaning not only does it have a 6502-based processor in it, but it also has ROM and RAM and input output and basically it translates all the input events and turns them into keyboard and mouse joystick signals which are then read by the cia chips so these are like two complete little computer systems that are handling input and output and interfacing with the amiga and jim brain was actually able to read the rom out of this Something a lot of people don't know with all these microcontrollers, they have ROM in them, but the ROM isn't exposed through the pins because there's already a CPU inside of here that can directly read that ROM that's masked or burned in when they make the chip. So actually extracting the contents of the ROM, it can be quite difficult. And there's a good article uh, that I'll link to about how Jim Brain managed to read it out of there a while ago. So I just found the specs. It has two kilobytes of ROM, 64 bytes of RAM, and 32 bidirectional input-output lines. Okay, so that's our look at a Commodore CD TV, a device that was maybe a bit of ahead of its time, or maybe it was just too expensive and uh, lacked a real market. Hey, thanks again to David for letting me have this system and for finding all those extra goodies for it so that I could demonstrate it. Thank you to my patrons for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. What, what you're thinking? There are some things you can find. I want to know. What you're feeling, tell me what's on your mind. Drums. This is the karaoke credits. Pure energy. This is the prairie, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Guitar solo. Hey, did you know that Minnesota is not actually a prairie state? It is considered a central plain state. This is the first central. Do 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 How does Tecmo get away with this? Here I am in silence, looking around without a clue. I find myself alone again in baby land, all alone with you. That's Information Society's crib, I can see behind your eyes the things that I don't know. If you hide away from me, how can our love grow? I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your mind. Drum solo. I'm their cat beanie, and this is Information Society, also known as Insop. Did you know during this drum solo that Kurt's duster was once worn by Dr. Max Planck, discoverer of Planck's constant? Oh, what good would it do? I surely never know. 
that what you say is true. Here I am in silence. <laughs> you wish that's a game I have to play. You and I in silence. Yeah. With nothing else to say. I want to know what you're thinking. Hey, Amanda has a vast network of over 5,000 friends. Now, that was the Facebook limit for friends for quite a while. This is very, very appreciation. I want to tell me what's on your mind. Here's the bridge. James comes from a long line of adventures and bon vivants. His grandfather invented the motor drone, and his grandmother was Spidora, the spider woman. That's, that's that's really something. something. Okay. 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 Here we go. Pure, Pure energy. energy. Pure energy. Destruction. Destruction. Ah. Destruction. Ah. Hanan Pure energy. Pure energy. Okay. okay. Guitar solo. Here we go. Here we go. For, for your information, instruments used in the production of this album include the IKS 900 sound for the EUSB 12 drum machine, it has 1541 ports, Profit 2002 sound for times 2 Yamaha TX rock module times 8, Moog mini Moog synthesizer, the Roland Super Jupiter synth times 3, the Roland JX3P synth, and the Roland S50 synth. That was all during the guitar solo. I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can't hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your mind. I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can't hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your mind to be continued. continued. 